How is it possible for a human to race a bike 22 hours out of every 24-hour cycle, crossing the North American continent from the Pacific to the Atlantic in under eight days? Or for a person to run through the soul-melting summer's heat of Death Valley, covering 135 miles in under two? Or for a woman in her 60s to swim from Cuba to Florida, immersed in icy ocean waters for 53 hours straight? It's hard to fathom how people can undertake these astonishing feats of human endurance, but the deeper question is why would one even be compelled to try? <laughs> Despite growing up nerdy and unathletic in New York City, I recently became involved in ultra-distance racing, first as a journalist, an author, and eventually as a minor participant. The journalistic part started about five years ago, when I had the opportunity to chronicle a race that Outside Magazine describes as the toughest test of endurance on the planet, the Race Across America, or RAM, a 3,000 mile long, non-stop bicycle race. It was an amazing experience. And I climbed into a minivan that year and followed this race for two weeks straight. I didn't know it was journalistically impossible. Luckily, I discovered that after I climbed into the minivan. In any case, before the race, I traveled the world, getting to know a handful of the solo racers to find out what made them tick and meet their families and so on. Then I followed the race, and after the race, I met again with these same racers to understand their experience and the lessons they learned. It was a truly amazing experience. You know, it, it was a two-week, unbelievable experience following this race. And I, I couldn't believe what these racers put themselves through. This race affected me deeply. After the race, um, I decided to write a book about it. Um, I learned that the human spirit is very, very strong, and I wanted to write a book that told the story of, of these racers' experience. After I wrote the book, I had the opportunity to travel nationwide, sharing with, with audiences the story of this race. And my book talks were attended by a wide range of people, everyone from couch potatoes to hardcore roadies. And regardless of their experience and their background, the two most common questions I heard were, why do people willingly take on such brutalizing and punishing races? And of course, how can they endure the agony of ultra-distance racing? And I'm going to tackle both of these questions today in the context of the Race Across America cycling event. But first, a little bit about the race. This race starts on the Pacific Coast, and it's been held every year since 1982. And one, once the gun goes off, the first person to race a prescribed 3,000-mile long route starting on the East Coast and ending on, uh, starting on the West Coast and ending on the East Coast is the victor. That's through the Sonoran Desert death zone, up and over the Rockies, down into the windswept plains of Kansas, through Missouri and the Ozarks, into the Midwest, up and over the Appalachians, and ending in Annapolis. Believe it or not, the winners will cover almost 400 miles a day, and they'll get by in about two hours of sleep out of every 24-hour cycle because the clock doesn't stop. So if you sleep, you lose. Amazing, huh? So, after I followed this race, I, I went around the, the country talking about it, and the how and the why were always what people asked. So here goes some of the hows. You know, when I first started this project, I got to know a lot of ultra-distance racers, um, and I expected that they would all fit into a common stereotype, that they would all be kooky, outcast, masochistic loners, and... <laughs> For sure some are, but most aren't, okay? Most aren't. And yet they do share some characteristics in common, the most obvious of which is a fanatical desire to race their bikes over vast distances and an incredible joy that they experience in doing this. But many of us have that same desire to, to ride our bikes over long distances and we don't all become solo ram racers. So what truly sets them apart? And here we come to the question of how. Racers go through an amazing experience during this race, okay? They confront all sorts of physical challenges, as you can imagine. 
So the question of how is a very important one. Um, it turns out there are a number of things that they do have in common. I have to go a little bit into what happens during this race for you to, to, to kind of understand um, why these athletes are so special, okay? The racers confront an amazing witch's brew of physical maladies during this race. Um, their joints self-destruct. They lose the use of their hands during this race because of nerve, nerve compression in their wrists. They get ghastly saddle sores that persist for days. They can go temporarily blind due to sun exposure. They come down with pneumonia and pulmonary embolisms and more. And by far the most horrifying physical condition that they experience during this race is the sudden loss of, of strength in the muscles that hold up their heads. And if this happens to an unlucky racer, his head will flop down, his chin will be pinned to his chest, and like a newborn baby, baby he will be unable to lift his head back up. Okay. You know, only a couple of hundred people have ever finished this race compared to a couple of thousand who have summited Mount Everest, and nobody finishes this race unscathed. Compared to the compelling visuals of the Tour de France, this race is crazier, it's more gothic, and it's even savage. But you know, there's an adage in endurance racing that says the longer the race, the more it's a mental challenge. And this is definitely true of Ram. Imagine maintaining focus and resolve sitting hunched over a bicycle saddle for 20, 21, 22 hours a day for up to two weeks. But by far the most vexing mental challenge has to do with sleep deprivation because racers hardly get any at all. You know, Amnesty International would consider this level of sleep deprivation to be torture, okay? Racers, personalities are completely transformed by it. They become paranoid and volatile, quick to anger. Uh, they scream and stomp around. They hallucinate for hours on end. One multi-time ram racer would hallucinate so vividly during the race that he would jump off his bike in the middle of the night to do battle with invisible beasts that turned out to be mailboxes. Okay. So this is what happens during ram. And at this point you might describe these racers as masochists. You might even use the word crazy because the English language lacks a word for people who are this well compelled. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you they're not masochists and they're not crazy and they feel every ache and pain just like you or I would. Okay. Still, uh, they are different <laughs> and they, they do share some characteristics in common. Okay. We talked about the fanatical desire to cover vast distances. We talked about the joy that they experience in so doing. But there are also a few nuts and bolts that I want to share with you. Some of the secret sauce that helps these racers do what they do. First, these racers are deeply curious about what happens when they push their minds and their bodies to the absolute limit. Over years of practice and through trial and error, each of these racers has developed an enormous arsenal of tools and techniques to address any possible problem that might crop up during their races. You know, secret emollients for pain and magic vestments for inclement weather and special meditations for when their minds snap and sputter. Believe it or not, racers simply can't wait for problems to crop up so they can test out their arsenals. The second is the ability to persevere through hours and hours of training on remote roads at all hours of the day or night. You know, racers train for this race for years, but in the year prior to their initial races, training volume will be anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 miles a month. In order to get this volume done, you have to crave getting out there and being all alone with nothing to think about but the task at hand. My friend Marco Bello, ultra racer, embodies this spirit. He works full time. He has, he's a father of three. He comes home from the office, puts his kids to bed at nine at night. He'll pull his bicycle off the wall go out for a training ride and come back in the middle of the night for a couple of hours nap. Third is a, a different relationship to the sensation of pain. You know, pain is experienced across a spectrum and on one extreme are people who catastrophize their pain. If you're a person like this and I take you and drop you into an icy cold bath, you are going to scream and get very emotional and jump out. On the other end of the spectrum are people who objectify their pain. 
If you're a person like this, you realize that the perception of pain is your choice. You realize that pain is temporary and finite. You recognize your pain and then you turn your attention to something more productive. You see pain as a signal that some adjustment needs to be made. And you simply accept pain as part of the sport that you love. And needless to say, ultra distance racers objectify their pain while racing. The fourth how has to do with the luxury of social support and validation. You know, academics who have studied talent and human achievement across a wide range of subjects from mathematics to art to business to sports all point to social acceptance and validation as an absolute linchpin. And this is true in ultra racing as well. You simply can't be an ultra racer without an enormous amount of social support and validation for a lifestyle choice this all-encompassing and expensive. So those are some of the, that's some of the secret sauce, some of the hows for how these folks can endure the agony of ultra-distance racing. Now let's ponder the why, which I think is an even more interesting question. But first, some data. The popularity of endurance racing is exploding in the Western world across all sorts of sports disciplines, from adventure racing to Ironman triathlons to long distance swimming and running and cycling. So the first question is at the macro level. Why is the popularity of this type of sport increasing? Now the way I see it, we yearn for experiences where our courage must be summoned, where we are stripped bare and cleansed and reborn as pure, better versions of ourselves. And at some level, endurance racing can accomplish this. It certainly did for me. Um, I learned a lot about myself through endurance racing. I learned how to ask for help, how to fail, how to be vulnerable. I found my authentic self through endurance racing. In my view, the rise of endurance racing is an outgrowth of this yearning for authenticity and, and self-revelation. And we live in the developed Western world in an age and a cultural milieu, a postmodern cultural milieu, if you will, characterized by cynicism and irony and twee and radical permissiveness and commoditization. And it's hard in this cultural environment for us to find our authentic selves. And we can do this, in a sense, through ultra racing. But you know, I think the more interesting answer to the question of why isn't at the macro level, it's at the micro or individual level. As it turns out, a fair percentage of ultra distance racers experienced some sort of trauma or abuse in their pasts. And it turns out they use ultra racing as a way to prove their self-worth to others. The late, great Yuri Robich, a five-time winner of the race across America, came back year in and year out and suffered mightily to win this race. And people would always ask him, Yuri, Yuri, why do you come back again and again? Uh, you, you, you describe this race as an absolute living hell. You, you say you're like Jesus on the cross during this race. Why do you keep coming back? And he said to prove that he was a good guy. You see, he had a hard scrabble upbringing, his father abandoned him when he was a young boy. His brother got all the attention, and he just wanted to prove that he was a good guy. And then there are those who are emotionally defended in real life, and they use their ultra racing as a way to achieve emotional intimacy with their crew members and their supporters. Uh, they push themselves to breaking in order to do this. Um, a colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces told me that after he did the race across America, he was much more plugged into people's feelings than he now cries at weddings, <laughs> okay? The emotion of this race is very significant. Um, there's a lot of crying, there's a lot of screaming, there's a lot of joy. So it is a very emotional experience. And then there are those who use their ultra racing to quiet their personal demons. Uh, a friend who's a widely accomplished uh, ultra racer and adventure racer um, told me that she grew up um, very, very shy, um, with ADD and some depression, and that her ultra racing completely resets her brain chemistry. She would be a completely different person without it. And then there were the seekers. 
You know, Kirk Johnson, he ran the Badwater Ultramarathon and he thought there might be a way running through the post-apocalyptic wilderness of Death Valley to reach the veil and to touch something beyond, a place where misery and transcendence were so deeply intertwined that it couldn't be without meaning. So those are some of the whys, but you know there's an even more important question. It's not how or why, it's do you see yourself in any of this? What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to learn about yourself? Do you know where your limits lie? That's the deeper question. My friend Adam Bickett said that through ultracycling, I realize I love the journey. It's pursuing that goal, finding that little bit extra in myself that I had to prove was there. There's meaning there for how you live your life. And for Adam, the journey was where he found happiness. So if you see yourself in any of this, then commit. Commit to going long, going long in whatever context that means for you. That's what I did in my 50s. I recognized myself in some of these hows and whys, and in my 50s I pushed myself to do three, four, five hundred mile bike races. And I, always, I already explained that it was a very self-revelatory experience. So commit to your journey. To, to setting limits beyond your, your imagination. And if you do, I promise, you will learn something deep and meaningful about yourself. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you out there. <laughs> <laughs>